Right, uh, my presentation today is going to look at Windrush Cymru. So what I'm going to be looking at is four particular periods within the history of black people or what they would refer to as the Windrush generation or what would be known as uh, uh, Black Caribbeans, etc. So we're going to look at the, the Moorish Spain period. I think this is important because this is prior to the occupation and colonization of the so-called West Indies by Christopher Columbus. So I think that's a good starting point because really and truly that was the last walk in the sun for black people. So after 1492, we see the enslavement period, which, which really took place with the transportation of Africans who were free, yeah, from West Africa to the so-called New World. The New World, when we when we say the New World, we, all, we also include Central America and the Caribbean islands. Then we're going to look at the Windrush period and the reasons behind that, because it was to rebuild the infrastructure of Britain after World War II. And if we get time, we'll look at Black Britain. So we look at the descendants, really, of the Windrush generation and the type of experience which they went through. Right, let's make a start. So here is an image which we look in at Boabdil, who's the last Moorish ruler, who's handing over the keys of the city of Granada to Ferdinand and Isabella. At this particular meeting here on the picture on the right, Christopher Columbus was actually there himself. And he basically said, if you read his diaries, that this was a sad moment in Western or in Spanish history. And the reason for that was because the gains, the scientific inquiry, et cetera, that the Moors had established in Spain for nearly 800 years had now come to an end. The Moors had introduced 17 university complexes into Spain well before any European nation actually established it themselves. And it was total social equality, which meant that women can be professors in many of these citadels or institutions, and they can also be educated as well. There was total social freedom for the genders or the sexes at this particular time. When European nations were subordinated women, especially when it came to education, and obviously as being advisors to rulers or being involved in the legal or the political system. So this is basically the beginning of the fall. So 1492 basically is where the Africans or the Moors actually begin to fall. And this is where we start to see their decline taking place, which was just over 500 years ago. If you look at this image here, you will notice this was the Treaty of Tordesillas. Well, the Treaty of Tordesillas was basically how the Pope had split the world up into two. He gave half the world to Spain and half the world to Portugal. If you look at the line, if you look at the line, one of the things you will notice over here, the second line here, which is really in 40, which is in 1494, is extended. And that is the reason why, because Brazil is in a Portuguese area. OK, so this is why in Brazil they speak Portuguese today. And Portugal was also given Africa and Asia. Spain was actually given the rest of the world, which was basically North America, South America, Canada, Alaska, the Caribbean islands, Central America. This is why majority of those places are still Spanish speaking even till today. So this is really what happened because Spain and Portugal were the two first nation states and they were also fighting one another in order to, in order to go for the riches of the so-called new world. Right, here is Abu Bakr II. Now, the reason why I have this image up here, this is the Empire of Mali. And this is around about 13, the early 1300s, around about 1302. Now, the reason why I have Abu Bakr II on here is a simple reason that they have found discoveries in America where this African monarch or king had founded the so-called Americas approximately two centuries before Christopher Columbus. So this has been omitted from the history books. And this has been this was recorded long before even Christopher Columbus came on the scene. If you can look at the right image here, what you'll notice, you can see all the currents coming from West Africa into the Caribbean islands, Central America. And the story is this. Around about 13, 13, between 1302 and 1307, he had sent 200 ships into the Atlantic Ocean. And what happened was one of those ships came back 
and the captain on the ship basically said he turned back because a massive force or current had taken the other ships into a particular area, which was literally unknown at that particular time. Because Abu Bakr II was obsessed with land, you know, across the Atlantic. Uh, the Atlantic was called the Ethiopian Sea at this particular time by Europeans. So the thing about it was that that ship came back so he decided to build another 2,000 ships. They went into the north, they went into the Atlantic, and they never returned. And these are the images of Mandinkas, which were found in Central and South America. So this is documented evidence that Africans were in the Americas long before Christopher Columbus. We even have in Arabic writing where Africans were actually in Central America, South America, the Caribbean islands, as early as the 10th century, as early as 930 AD. But all these things have been written out of the history books, etc. So here you can see, you can see the, you can see this, the signs um, around the mouth, you can see the turban, because obviously he was a Muslim, etc. Here's another picture of a so-called, what they call the Negro portrait, which was found in Peru. This is around about the ninth, about the 900s. This is a 10th century AD. So this is evidence. And Columbus himself talked about asking people which he saw in the so-called Americas. But one thing I want to emphasize, Christopher Columbus never stepped foot on North or South America. He only stepped on peripheral America, which was the Caribbean islands. So why did they say he discovered America when he never stepped foot, foot on any of those continents? So you can see there, you can see there's another Muslim. OK, you can see the head uh, gear, et cetera, you can see the thick lips. So these these are just these are just documented evidence in sculptures showing of the African presence in the Americas who didn't come over the slaves. This is what's important, didn't come over the slaves. All right. Now, the British West Indies started to become colonized as early as 1623. Because obviously, I talked about the Treaty of Tordesillas, where Spain and Portugal had divided up the world. Holland and Britain allied themselves approximately 1602 to 1604 in order to try to attack both of these powers. The Dutch had focused on the Portuguese territories. This is how the Dutch ended up in the 1600s in places like India, Malaysia, Indonesia. And this is how the British ended up in places like the Caribbean islands and North America, starting off with Virginia. So there you can find where these two allies literally came together in order to wear down the Catholic states, because by this time they were Protestants. We know the Protestant Reformation established around about 1517 under Martin Luther and Britain at this time and Holland were Protestant countries. There's the great Henry Morgan, okay? This is Captain Morgan. He was actually from Clan Rumney, okay, in Wales, and he became the governor of Jamaica. He was a lieutenant governor of Jamaica. He was actually a pirate, so we know that he was stealing from Spanish ships, and this is around the route, this is around the time of Charles II. Charles II's period is known as the Restoration Period, okay? The Restoration Period is where they restored uh, the monarchy after the death of, um, what's you call it now? Uh, I can't remember his name, it, it escapes me. But the thing is, which is important here, is that um, Oliver Cromwell, that's right, Oliver Cromwell had executed his father, obviously because we know about the English Civil Wars, etc. He became like the head of states, where Britain at that time became a republic. And after the death of Oliver Cromwell, then what happens is, is that they go for the restoration period where they put the son of Charles I on the throne. So it was during this period where Britain now is now intensifying its raids in the Caribbean. If you look at the island of Jamaica, for instance, that was it. That was founded by the British in 1655, taken away from the Spanish. And um, this was round up, yeah, so this was during the time of Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell's forces, and a massive, in, uh, um, what you call it, indentured labor force from Ireland, Ireland was sent over to the Caribbean. So this is Captain Morgan's Jamaican rum, etc. 
We know he had a he had a plantation in Jamaica, which he called Clan Rumney, and he had over 100 slaves working on his plantation. He was raided in many, many places in Central as well as South American, in South American coasts. So he was basically a licensed pirate. He gave some of his riches and wealth to the crown, and this is what got him knighted to become Sir Henry Morgan. Now, if you look at the slave system now, what we find is that there were different forms of classifications for different slaves. So you had the colored people, which were your mixed race progeny, because women didn't go to the Caribbean islands. Then we had the three blacks. They were the, they were the minority on the, uh, on the Caribbean islands. And then we had the slaves. And the slaves were divided into four sections or categories. So the most important of them all were the mechanics. Now, if you watch any slave, if you watch any film or documentary on slavery, they focus on the last one, the field hands. OK, and the reason is, is because they don't want to really emphasize the skilled workers which were coming out of the new world, because when they were going into the so-called new world, for instance, we know they already had those skills. Many people were doctors and scientists, etc., because of the empire of Bali and Songhai and the empire of Ghana. And there was educational institutions in West Africa for thousands of years. So this is something which I think that people need to understand that they weren't taking out thick or stupid people. These people already had skills. And this is one of the reasons why West Africa was targeted for its labor to rebuild the Western world, because the majority of the people which were sent to the Western world worked in agriculture. So as far as carpentry and, you know, handiwork and blacksmiths was concerned, there was a small number of people from Britain which was going over to the so-called new world, which can contribute to the building of that society. So we have the mechanics, then we have the domestic servants. Domestic servants were people who worked in the house. They pretty, they pretty much lived a comfortable-ish life. But domestic servants here also meant, you know, they were what they call comfort girls. So many of them would have been sexual possessions of the slave owners. Headman was a privileged job as well. They would ride the cats, and mules, etc., of their slave owners from one plantation to another. So it's considered a privileged job. However, when they went to other plantations, they would have ended up staying with in the slave quarters. So this is what this was the demeaning part of the job. But besides that, it was considered a very prosperous kind of position. And then the last one is the field hands or the boiling hands. Okay which was not the majority in the, pla in, 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 in the Caribbean islands, the majority of the mechanics. So why am I mentioning this is because what will happen in a few hundred years time after Britain's infrastructure is destroyed, they're going to ask for these people who've been looking after the British aristocracy from the 1600s to come over in the 1940s and to rebuild their country. Okay, here's land clan Rumley Hall. This is uh, where Henry Morgan was supposed to have lived. There's some evidence, there's some people who say that um, he was born here, but very little evidence actually points to that. It looks like he was born in Monmouth, Monmouthshire. Okay, so here are just some of the things which uh, needs to be emphasized about Wales' connection with the Caribbean islands, especially Jamaica. So we know rum was. Um, distilled and created in the Caribbean islands. And one of the things which I pose that is rum connected to the areas which Henry Morgan himself actually owned, Clan Rumney and Rumney, where the word rum is written in, that might be a connection. Because we do know that when many British people went over to the Caribbean islands, they would insert their own towns or villages on the landscape. This is why if you go to Jamaica today, you would notice there's places like Surrey, there's places like Kingston. These are places in England. So we have to understand that when people go to places, they take a bit of their home with them, not just their culture, but ideas of their home, and they place those things on the geographical locations that they are staying or reside in. And the other thing what to emphasize as well is that rum was also produced in Newport, Rhode Island. So there's another connection with Wales. Now, Newport, Rhode Island is in the United States of America. And obviously, we know about Newport Road. We know about Henry Morgan uh, producing rum in Jamaica. Rum is also being produced in America in Newport Road. So these are all giving you the Welsh connection of the Americas. 
So what we're going to do is look to go look at the abolition movement that rose up because change, major changes are going to be made. Slavery is a horrific system, etc. The people have been enslaved as early as 1492, 1493, which came from Spain. And then when uh, Charles V actually commissioned for more slaves to be brought into his realm, which was in Spain. OK, what started happening then was that when they started to explore North America, etc., more and more slaves were needed to cultivate that mass amount, that massive amount of land. OK, so what we know about the abolition movement within Wales, as well as England, that boy, the sh there was a sugar boycott that was took out, which, which took place in order to awaken the masses within this country of what was really happening in the Caribbean islands, because they didn't realize how horrific the slave system was, even though they were they were uh, benefiting from the commodities, resources and minerals that were coming out of these islands. Then. Obviously, they refused to put a boycott on the textile industries, OK? Even though there was a boycott to some extent, it had very little effect because of the amount of people that, was, were, that were working, you know, British people who were working in many of the um, mills, especially in Lancashire as well as Manchester, OK? But at the same time, even though the Civil War was taking place during this time in the 1860s, Britain actually supported the southern states. OK, they supported them militarily as well as the commodities, the import and export as well. So this is important to know. And obviously the slave trade was ended, obviously, because it wasn't really profitable. So when we're looking at the abolition movement, for instance, were they doing it for goodwill or was it impacting the economy or the wealthy of this country? And we know it was the latter, you know, because if slavery went for another 500 years, it would have. So we have to be realistic about why the abolition movement really came together. That's not to say there was not sincere people amongst abolitionists, you know, but there was a lot of wealthy people who were part of the abolition movement who can see that it wasn't really money making in a sense because plantations were burning, a lot of the commodities and products wouldn't come into Britain in time, okay? They couldn't pay back the large amount of loans from Lloyds of London and Barclays, which are merchant banking institutions, which was established as a result of slavery. Both of them came, came out of the slave experience, these banking institutions. Then we have the abolition of the Slave Trade Act. And this is what's important. In 1807, when they passed the Slave Trade Act, one of the emphasis here was to ensure that slaves would not be transported from Africa to the so-called New World, as well as from Africa to Britain. This is what the Slave Trade Act was based upon. But slavery still existed because it was trying to phase out. So even though the abolition movement was there to try to abolish slavery in its totality, they had to phase it out slowly. That way that the rich aristocracy and the monarchy could still benefit from the resources, minerals and commodities that were coming out of that country. So one of the disadvantages of this act, even though Britain praised itself of the abolition of the slave trade act, one of the problems was that it had a sh labor shortage on the island. This is a bad thing. It had a labor shortage on the island. So what happened was the island became more of a concentration camp. So some of the reasons why it went through, fuel was get you know, fuel was getting expensive in a sense. Okay. What we mean by fuel, the type of things which was needed to transport people over and back. Okay. There was a large amount of loss of money. But what happened later on is that the Yankee Clippers, which were American ships, was was built much, which was built much uh, better and it was much faster in collecting Africans and bringing them back to the Americas. And it was competing with the British. And this is one of the reasons why they actually passed the act in order to stop America from monopolize, taking monopoly over or on the slave trade. So 1907, the act, the Slave Trade Act of 1807 did not end slavery. So this is what's important. It didn't end, it didn't end, it didn't end the slave conditions. It didn't end the breaking up of the family. It didn't end, uh, it, it actually increased beatings because there was a shortage of labor. 
Slave executions was more realistic at that particular time. Rape intensified. A young girl as, er as early as nine or 10 years old was actually encouraged to breed the next slave generation. So rape of young girls was very common after the 1807 Act. These are the externalities. In other words, the byproduct of, 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 of a move or, or amendment or a reform or a policy. This is what came out of this particular act. Okay. After the act was passed, evidence showed that slaves were worked even harder. Okay. And they would have been because there was a shortage of labor. So when there's a shortage of labor, there's more work. And when there's more work and there's less people, people's going to work harder or overtime, etc. So there was really a little bit of, there was not much of a way of benefit as far as reducing the slave trade. They had to abolish it in its totality. Okay, so I won't look too much at these. These are just breaking things down. I just want to give you a flavor of what was taking place in the Caribbean islands at this particular point. But what I will end up with is the abol ab abolition of slavery in 1834. It didn't really end up going, and this was the, to abolish slavery in its totality. However, the white British plantocracy were totally against it. And what they did, they put black people under what was called apprenticeships, which meant that children under the age of six could not work. OK, so from the words from from age of six upwards, they had to work to their former plantation owners for approximately five days a week with no pay. This is what happened. They started to charge them. So they moved them from physical slavery to wage slavery. This is what happened. We know about reparations. Reparations was given to them. It was approximately 20 million. I think it's approximately about 17 billion in today's money. And the British people didn't know that it was actually finished off paying. I think it was about uh, 2015, 2016. That's when they actually finished off paying the reparations to the plantation owners. Nothing was paid to the slaves at all. And this is why the Caribbean islands and the people in the Caribbean are still poor today. So you can see from these different conditions how and why people was going to migrate here for a better opportunity. OK, this is what it was about, because at the time when the wind rush generation came over here, all the Caribbean islands were under British hegemony or control. OK, so Jamaica, Trinidad, Grenada, Barbados, St. Kitts, etc. They were all controlled by the British with the Queen or the King being the monarchy, depending on which era we're talking about. So let's have a look at black labor now. OK, so one of the things I want to emphasize here is the importance of the West Indies, because that was what Columbus called the Caribbean islands, the West Indies, because he was traveling west to get to East. And he thought he was in India. When he got to the Bahamas and all these other places, he thought he was in India. And that's why it's called the West Indies. And this couldn't be close to the truth at all. He was nowhere in India at all. So this is how they became known as the West Indies and why the people call themselves West Indians. But what I want to emphasize here is the importance that West Indians at the time, were very, very much involved with establishing and maintaining the British order in the Caribbean islands. A few blacks in Britain formed the permanent black community. This is actually in the UK, and we know also in Wales. During World War I, several thousands were brought to Britain to work, to do the work that would free Britons for combat service. So many blacks had come over here at the turn of the century, as early as the 1900s, OK, as military officers, in order to make those people go to fight, obviously, the Germans on the eastern or western front at the time when, obviously, war was declared at that time. So this is important for us to know. So we slowly had a West Indian or a black community slowly come into the UK, OK? There are West Indian troops here. OK, serving on the Western Front. This is in 1916. But what I want to put your mind to, so if you look at the guns which they had, they never really used them. They were used to dig trenches. These, this, this, this picture is actually a misrepresentation because they were afraid of giving black West Indian guns in case they may turn on their white officers because of the way they were treated in the Caribbean islands by white people under British control, authority or hegemony. So this picture really is only showing them a thing that they were cooks, 
cleaners. They were washing the clothes of the white officers, etc. They didn't even really basically um, get into war for combat. And when they did, it was only because they lost a lot of white people at the time. And then they put them in, you know, on the front line. So these, is, these, these are the missing notes or the missing links in history. But this is the West Indian. And many, a majority of them actually came from places like Jamaica, but also St. Kitts, Barbados, Trinidad, etc. OK, and here it is uh, other British West Indians in uh, 1917 collecting shells. The amount of them which were collecting shells, some of them had gone off, some of them didn't, and they would be exploded into their faces, destroying their bodies was horrific. So these are the sort of dirty work which they were doing. So very little combat by West Indian troops under the British West Indian Regiment actually occurred during this time. And they only use them when it's convenient for them because they lost many of their own men. And this is what has happened through history. Okay, even women actually were part of the West Indian Regiment as well. This is a picture of uh, women, um, which goes back to 1915. So what I'm trying to emphasize is the importance of looking at West Indian communities established in Britain before the Windrush period. Here is just an important note if we're looking at Wales, where they believe that the first race riot actually took place in Wales itself. In America, they called it uh, Red Summer. There was something which happened in 1919 when soldiers returned back with their revolvers to Britain and to America. We're talking about black soldiers now. There was a there was race riots that took place because the economies of America and Britain had slowed down. It took a lot of white people as well as black people out of work at this time and riots ensued. And these were what they were called race riots, where white people were indiscriminately attacking black people. So we know that in Cardiff, the first the earliest one, I think, is Cadixton. This was about an individual where they were told where he was told not to walk in a particular street. OK, Newport, an allegation of gender abuse where a black man was accused of touching or hitting or abusing in some physical way or verbal way, a white woman. OK, and these were just pretexts and very little evidence of, of come out of these events to substantiate that these these things which actually happened. But in Cadixton, somebody actually got stabbed. The black person who was involved, OK, actually stabbed a white person. OK, he had basically had enough. So it was a white person who was killed in the Cadixton. Three people died in the Cardiff uh, riots. OK, so and that lasted, I think, approximately three to five days. So what I'm trying to show you here is when these soldiers uh, came back to Britain at this time, a lot of white youths, which would have been young, were attacking them on the pretext of doing X, Y, and Z, you know, just making up stories. So this is part of local history. There's Enoch Powell. Many of you may know them from the river, you know, River of Blood speech that took place in the late 1960s, talking about mass immigration of West Indians. But what people don't know that it was um, this person, Enoch Powell, who was actually sent to the Caribbean islands because he was, he was a health minister to ask black people to come over to help in the establishment of the National Health Service, which was established in 1945. So he, it was himself that encouraged immigration from the Caribbean islands. And in a short space of time, he was against immigration. So this is what happens sometimes, where politicians will go over and ask for immigration because it's a cheap workforce, it's cheap labor. This is what they want, cheap skilled labor. This is what they wanted. And what happened is when they came over and they were bringing their children, they were getting married, having families, and those kids now were going to school with other white children, etc. Now it became a problem. So he talked about the so-called river of blood, where the blood of black people, even white people, was going to spill because it was what he's basically talking about was a race war. So let's have a look at um, the Nationalization Act of 1948. So this is where we talk about approximately 500 West Indian, mainly men, come over on the so-called Windrush. This was to encourage, okay, people from the Commonwealth countries because they were known as British subjects to come over here, come over here to work because Britain needed attention 
after the bomb bombing of the Germans in 19 in the 1945 and prior. So these are important facts for us to understand why they were asked to come over here. Many of the white men that were here refused to do the jobs of picking up bricks and things like that, you know, and this is why many of them, you know, there was also a shortage of men as well. Many, many of these white men had died in many of these combats or many of these battles. So if we look at things from a historical perspective, we can put in place what is needed to understand why they needed West Indian labor, male as well as female, to come over here to build the structure, to build the infrastructure and the new and to uphold the new structures, which was the National Health Service of 1945, as well as the welfare state. But the welfare state, they were not allowed to go on. They weren't here for welfare. OK, they were here to rebuild. They were here for their labor. Black people were not allowed welfare. The first recipients of welfare were white females and then white males. So this is important to understand. And people who were Commonwealth citizens over here were not entitled to welfare until at least the mid 1970s, if that was the case. But there was a lot of work for them. Many, many black families had, you know, two or three jobs between the husband and the wife. OK, and in 1962, 1962, the Commonwealth Immigration Act to reduce the amount of black people settling here. So we knew about um, as early as the 1950s, as early as the 1950s, we know about quarter of a million West Indians had come over here, you know. So a large amount of West Indians or black people coming over here to rebuild this country, OK, not to sponge off the state. And then what takes place later on, we look at the Race Relation Acts. But the Race Relation Acts here needs to be put into context. Racial segregation existed in this country from 1948 right up until this particular period of 1965. Racial segregation existed. OK, so the Race Relation Acts of 1965 declared unlawful any discrimination on grounds of color, race or ethnic or national origin in certain places, such as public resorts, seaside resorts, hotels, restaurants, okay, public houses or what we call pubs, theatres, you know, dance halls, swimming pools. Black people were not allowed to go to any of these places. They were asked to come here to work, not to enjoy themselves. Now you'll understand why many black people had to, uh, had to engage in home parties or house parties during this time, where people were complaining, well, they're playing their music too loud, it's too late, etc., because they were not allowed in any of these public places. This is why. You can restrict the people from enjoying things from, the, from, from society or from the social realm, and then when they go into their own private homes and try to compensate for that, you're still denying them or depriving them. And this is the problem. So this is what the Race Relation Act of 1965 was supposed to establish. More social integration of blacks and whites within society, especially when it came to elements of enjoyment. Black people were denied, to, in, in denied enjoyment until 1965. They were just here to work. And we know about housing discrimination as well. They were allowed to come over here to build houses, but they weren't necessarily over here to live in them. So where are the people going to live? So let's have a look at the Windrush of Wales. OK, so the Windrush generation. So many of them would have left. Many of them would have settled in places like Manchester, Birmingham, London and Gloucester before they moved to Wales. OK, so what we start to see in as early as the 1950s, we start to see Windrush people or generation come into Wales. Many of them would have settled in places like Butown, for instance. OK. But we know that the, the, you know, we know the vast majority went to places like Barry, Swansea, you know, uh, Newport. These were the main areas which they would have went to. They would have gone to other areas, but they were the four main areas. Barry, Swansea, Cardiff, Newport. Barry, we include Caddickston as well. OK, many West Indians who were seeking upward mobility left Butown to settle in areas like Grangetown. Grangetown was a working middle class area. It was quite a wealthy area at the time. And if you know the history of Grangetown, we know this is the place where most of the merchants and most of the families of uh, slave owners in the Caribbean had settled when they came back to Cardiff. 
This is historically documented. So that's what Grangetown was. So Grangetown was quite uh, considered quite a working area, quite a low middle class or low working middle class area. And many black people who had dreams of upward mobility to come over here would have settled in those places. Most of the Windrush women who were qualified teachers back in the Caribbean were refused work in all in all Welsh schools. And it still permeates even till today. Unfortunately, the reports that are coming out is that the amount of black and women and black uh, men who were unable to get jobs in public schools in Wales is phenomenal in a sense. And what I mean by that, they're not allowing. So things haven't really changed. Things haven't really changed. And what I want to emphasize, some of the things which they would use for black women not to work in the educational system was that they took their degrees in Jamaica and it's not recognized there. But we know that London was accrediting the teaching colleges in the Caribbean. It was just a British colony. But yet white women who grew up in the Caribbean, who were seventh, eighth, ninth generation, who were brought up, lived in the Caribbean islands, who came here to work as teachers, could work as teachers. So it was clearly it was racial discrimination. A white woman born in Jamaica had the same qualification, yeah, as a, as a, as a black woman, but only they could work in Welsh schools or even English schools, but we're going to focus on Wales. And this thing permeates and proliferates even till today. And unfortunately, many of them who had those qualifications either had to redo their the same qualification that they did in Jamaica it was the same qualification they did here. They had to redo it again to give them themselves a chance for access. This is what they said to many of them. And many of them said they wouldn't do that. And this is how they ended up working in the National Health Service, because that's who they really wanted them for. Because at the time in Britain, the white average white family was a nuclear family. A nuclear family is a male breadwinner and a stay-at-home mum. The black family has never been a nuclear family in Britain, and especially in Wales. They were a symmetrical family. A symmetrical family means you have two workers in the house, two breadwinners. That's what a symmetrical family is. Family is. There's two breadwinners who look after things outside the home as well as inside the home. And they both share the responsibility of looking after of the kids. However, between the average household, there was an average, the minimum of two jobs. I know with my parents, say for instance, they had five jobs between them. That's the way it was back then, which meant that the oldest children literally had to grow up themselves. And this is why the stops and searches were, were horrific because the police constabulary in Wales, as well as England, were well aware when they were brutalizing black boys in the black community, there was hardly any adults there. The police knew this. And this is why they were able to get away with this such a long time, because they had to work. Many of them wanted up in mobility. They wanted to work in decent areas or work in decent areas. OK, and they, they were really looking to get the, the, the fruits from this country, even though the vast majority of them came over here to work for a short space of time and go back home. So these are just some of the things I want to emphasize. Then you had things like this, which is the radiogram, which many of you may or may not have known. This was a classical, this was the hi-fi stereo system of the 1960s. And these are the things which they would have used to party. OK, they would invite friends over from their island or from other islands, and they would engage in some type of, you know, social event. OK, so what started happening in Wales in particular, we started to see that many of the black males or the black men, the Windrush generation, were very, very unhappy about their condition, about their position. OK, how the way they were being abused in work. So many of them decided that they wanted elements of upper mobility. So many of them went into their own business and within Grangetown, as an example, OK, what you will find in Cardiff is that um, many men ended up having their own business. Some of them were selling records. They were, they were dealing with imported records because, you know, we know about rock and roll in the 1960s, etc. Rock and roll is what established um, ska music to, la to a large extent. So there's a, there's, there, there's a relationship with the mu on the music scene with North America and especially Jamaica, where those imports were very, very important. A lot of people would have brought their own records over, etc., in order to remind them of home. 
But these were the kind of things that it opened. It opened general stores, okay, record shop. Many of them opened up their own building firms because they were skilled builders. Many of them opened up their own carpentry firms. And painter and decorators came out of that. So a lot of black males were now becoming self-employed. And in Wales, there was more self-employed black males from the Windrush generation than there was females. OK, so this is uh, regeneration, culture and heritage. This is just showing you how things were, where the economy will always change. Economies will always change. And what I try to emphasize here is that when we're looking at the economy within Western Europe, within Britain, whenever the economy changes, the family structure changes. So I'll give an example. When people lived in rural areas within Wales, they were extended families. And when industrialization slowly came in from the 1750s onwards, and you start to see small segments of families move from rural areas into established towns and cities, then nuclear families were established. And then when the technological age came just after 1945 onwards, we started to see it move from nuclear families slowly into matrifocal families or single headed households, whether a woman was divorced, widowed, OK, separated. And then obviously from the 1980s onward, we start to see a proliferation in long parenting where there'd be an unmarried woman having children. OK, so there's four types of single mothers. So that is what happens when the economy changes. We know about the economies in Wales. When we started to see the minor strikes take place and Margaret Thatcher closing down the pitch, we started to see an increase. Uh, we started to see a decline in marriages in Wales. OK, this was the first thing because many of the men were out of work and they couldn't afford to keep a family. Many women were forced into work, especially part time roles in the 1980s. OK, and then what we started to see after that, because most of the men were unemployed, we slowly started to see the lone parent household start to take hold within Wales. So we know that the family structure within Britain, for instance, and Wales in particular, is related strongly with the economy. And that's what history has taught us. And a similar thing has taken place with the black community to a large extent. Even though there was a two working household and they both worked full time, etc. This is what it would have impacted them with two parents being at work. And we know from a historical perspective is that when two parents are working and trying to keep up hold of their mortgage and trying to give their children creature comfort children don't benefit from their parents absence okay and there's a sense of um desperate desperation really and truly so these are things for us to think about when we're looking at working parents bringing up children where does our responsibility lies in the employment sector or with our family we have the best of both worlds. Black people have tried it, and black people's been doing it since slavery. Okay, there's always been a Jew working household since the 1400s. It's only been like that in Britain in the last 20, 30 years. Okay, so there is a template already telling you what a Jew working household will produce in the next hundred years, because black people have been involved in it historically for the past 500 years. And it hasn't really benefited them as, as a family unit, as a collective. Maybe some individuals have benefited from it, but we need to look even further. What is it actually, what kind of impact it's having within society? Then we find that in the 1960s, another Race Relation Act was passed in 1968. It's sometimes called the Homestead Act. Okay, they actually extended the Act of 1965 to incorporate areas and whatever the case may be. So this is something for us to realize that black people at the time were not allowed social housing. Many of them in many areas, they refused to gain social housing. And when they were buying properties in wealthy areas, a lot of white people slowly started to move out. How were they able to get properties? Banks weren't giving them loans because they had very little in the way of collateral. And we know that banks were discriminatory against black people, even though many of them had three jobs. The banks would still not give them loans, but they would give a white man who had one who had one job a loan in order to take on a mortgage. So it was clear it was clearly discriminatory. The thing is, what I want to emphasize here is what black men had to do in particular, along with black women, but black men majority of them, they end up what started to establish what was known as the partner system. 
And the pardon system basically was where 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 men put their money into a pot every week, every month, because in those days there were wage packets, not wage slips. Yeah, there's wage packages, wage slips, but didn't get paid into the bank like they are today. Your wage package, you went in and your money was given to you in cash. That's what it was like at that time. And it was weekly. It was very rare that people were being paid monthly. People back then were paid weekly because people eat daily. This monthly thing is a new innovation, really and truly. However, with that taking place, a lot of these men, which were being paid weekly, they would put so much shillings into a pot, you know, or pounds into a pot. And then what would happen is each and every other month or whatever the case may be, they would end up having a... Uh, I have enough money to put down his deposit for the mortgage, but they would still have to pay that money in until all 60 of those individuals end up having houses. And that's how black people were able to obtain homes. This is how they were able to obtain homes. No help from the government, very little help from the banking institutions. So they had to rely on self in order to make those radical changes. And then the Race Relation Act of 1976 was passed because of the amount of discrimination that was taking place in the workplace. OK, where many of them were slowly being thrown out of the employment sector, especially those black people who were born to West Indian parents in this country. But the problem was with this was that a year before that, they passed the Equal Pay Act. The Equal Pay Act was passed for white females. And this discussion had been taking place as early as 1970. In 1970, they already passed the Equal Pay Act for white women to get paid the same as white men for them to be in the same sector or doing the same job. But it didn't get enacted till five years later, which was approximately November of 1975. But the problem with this, when white women's wage packet from 1975 got fatter, the black woman who doing exactly the same job as them was still getting the same low pay. So it was clear that the Equal Pay Act, which was passed in 1975 in November, was basically for white women, not black women. So even in the employment sector within Wales, there was a there was a serious stratification between the races. OK, so what happened was they had to include this in the Racial Relation Act of 1976 that black women shouldn't be discriminated on, you know, for doing the same job, uh, you know, as her white female or white male counterpart. So black women were totally omitted from the Equal Pay Act for women, which meant that the legal system did not see black women in Wales as women. This is really important. They didn't see them as women. I don't know what they saw them as, but we know during slavery, they didn't see us as human beings. So what did they see us in 1976, which wasn't that long ago? OK, so these are just some of the things I want to emphasize. Um, hundreds of thousands of women, men and children came over to leave their homelands to rebuild the mother country. They believed that Britain was the mother country for them. OK, and like I said earlier, it was about post-war Britain. They needed their labor. So a lot of skilled workers came here. There's 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 this notion that the people who came from the Caribbean had very little to offer this country and had no skills. This is not true. If that was the case, British people wouldn't have lived comfortably in the Caribbean islands and benefiting from the Caribbean islands where holidays are concerned. Because all, all, what holidays are, it's an extension of the plantocracy system where where people from this country go to the Caribbean islands and live the life of a planter. They sat on the veranda looking at the natives looking after them. That's all it basically is. It's the slave. It's living a slave experience. That is what holidays are really about. They're not really there to learn about the people. They're not really there to learn about the country. They're there to enjoy the fruits of the country, but not learn and engage and help the people. They got these massive complexes in the Caribbean island where people from this country are told not to help the local people which means that the hotels and the motels and all these other all, all these other places which are built by British money, German money, American money, goes back to those countries. I was on a radio interview in 2012 and the minister on the radio turned around and said for every for every one Jamaican dollar that is made in Jamaica as an example, only three cents stays in the country. The rest goes to Germany, Britain, Spain, Portugal, 
America, whatever the case may be. And this is where the people are poor. So the people are still being exploited even till today. Okay, so we've looked at the things of different forms of West Indian women which came over. I think I've spoke, spoke about most of these. Um, yeah, I talk about most of these, but what I want you to emphasize is that black women as mothers were not stay at home mums. They was not stay at home mums. This is this is really important. This is why they are very upset with the British government about the Windrush scandals. They came over here to work. OK, some of them held on two jobs and a family. And the fact of the matter is they are being treated like whatever and their children who actually came over here on their passport. This is disgusting. And this is what's upsetting these people who are now in their 70s plus. This is why they are very upset about this. And we need to look at it from their perspective. I came over here and gave you two jobs. You took taxes off me. I paid my stamp. I even bought my own home. And I can't enjoy the fruits of that. And now you want to deport me back to my country and my child back to, my to, 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 to a country it doesn't even know? This, this is a crime. This is a crime. And the reality is, is that for us to be treated the same as how they see immigrants today, there's no comparison. We never came over here to live off welfare. And besides, we couldn't get welfare. And that's something which they don't tell their people. But the reality is, is that these women, you know, many of them who are still alive, are very, very unhappy about the Winra scandal and how they're being treated. It's like the taxes that they have paid came to nothing, and they are nobodies. I talked about um, working in the health service. The thing I want to emphasize here, that when they put on nurses' uniform, just like the men that did very little, in the British West Indian Regiment on the first, even the Second World War, they were there to dig trenches and wash the white man's, sh polish their shoes and wash their clothes and all these other things. Not really, not really prepared for combat. A similar thing took place in the health service with black women. Black women were used as basically hospital janitors until the black female nurse corps unions came together to change this. Why should they be treated like this, taking out pans, etc.? We want to give injections. We want to feel pulses. We even we want to, you know, carry out deliveries. Why are we being used as cleaners in these hospitals? So they took a stand, and look today what's taking place with the coronavirus, how they are being treated. So even though they literally propped up the National Health Service in Wales, look how they're being treated in these institutions as patients. Even back then when they were working for the NHS, they couldn't even become patients. They couldn't even become patients. They weren't allowed to become patients. The only people who were allowed to become patients were white males and females. And this is something that is, 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 is being forgotten to a large extent. A lot of people today think that it, it was easy social integration into these institutions, into society, but this is not the case. And we know it's not the case because of all these different acts which are being passed in order to increase social integration for black people who work alongside white people or who live in close proximity with them. OK, so we talked about these things about Windrush. Many of them came over. These were the type of experience which they would have had. Uh, carpentry building. Many of them worked in factories. OK, many of them were train drivers, bus drivers. These are a lot of the jobs, the middle part with a lot of the jobs which the white people in this country did not want to do. It was considered demeaning to a large extent. And even when Gaddafi was over here studying in the 1960s, he noticed that the the amount of Jamaicans that were driving buses and sweeping the streets. This is what they were over here to do, the disgusting jobs that other people of this country don't want to do. And now we see with the care industry that's happening now, the amount of African women are working in the care industry, you know, is unbelievable. So the reality is, is that the cheap labor and the jobs that the local people don't want to do, they have to go abroad to bring them over here to exploit them in two ways to give them low wages and to give them the worst jobs. That's not to say that there's no um, positive things within these jobs. But when you're relegated to a certain labor market because of how you look or your appearance, it is clear who really is benefiting from the labor market.
And then other people that came over during the Windrush period, they worked in the arts, or many of them were actors, they worked in drama, music was another thing, many of them were entertainers and dancers. So we're moving more to the modern era now. So Desmond Decker and the Aces, this was the first Jamaican reggae number one, which was called the Israelites in 1969. And this actually made a mark for the Windrush generation, that now they were recognized as a serious um, composers as far as music was concerned. Their music, which was coming from another country, was now recognized nationally nationally and this was really important for them on um, them acknowledging their stay their contribution and their settlement to this country and in 1973 the whalers this is what they were called the whalers was on the old gray whistle test okay singing concrete jungle this is 1973 i was about four i think at this time and one of the things is i stayed up late and i didn't know this was coming on i remember seeing these black people on tv and at the time, it was a color television. Most people back in the 1970s had black and white television. So many of the African Caribbean household had color TV. I, I, I was one of them, you know, so I, I was quite fortunate. And when I saw this image for the first time, it actually impacted me because black, we didn't see black people on TV. And to see these people who came from Jamaica, the parents where my country came from performing, and being acknowledged, this had a massive impact on modern culture, especially for the black youth living in this country, with who's dealing with police brutality, etc. And the police brutality was based on the stop and search. The stop and search thing has its roots in the Vagrancy Act of 1824. In 1824, when men, white men in Britain were out of work, it was considered a crime. And the reason why unemployment was considered a crime was because are you going to eat? You have to steal to eat. OK, this is what is known as the Vagrancy Act. You're just loitering, just laying around, etc., waiting for something to happen. So before it happens, we will arrest you. This is how it came about. And what happened was as early as the 1950s, those sus laws, which are known as the, uh, the stop and search, the sus laws, which meant that this person was a potential suspect. That's where sus comes from, okay? Suspect, okay? May, may do something. So I'm gonna arrest him on a suspicion that he may do something, okay? And it had increased within the black community. And what I want to emphasize here that Rastafari as a movement, if you go back to the whalers, et cetera, became the, um, the epitome of for change, looking at the social inequalities of black people, especially within Britain. Because Rastafari is a movement, it was going through a similar thing in Jamaica. They, you know, the Jamaican police had hated them. They saw them as rebels. They saw them as problems, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a parallel. So you started to see where the dreadlocks became a symbol in the 1970s on was of black youths who was using it to enhance their identity and to fight police brutality. Then we look at the Notting Hill riots. The Notting Hill riots took place in 1958. And this is what brought about the, the, um, the Notting Hill Carnival. The Notting Hill Carnival now is predominantly a white, um, what you call it, experience now. They've literally taken that off the Caribbean community. But the Notting Hill Carnival, okay, came out because of the Notting Hill riots. The Notting Hill riots was a race riot where a few people were literally killed. The black or the West Indian community in London decided they were going to hold like an annual street party every August in celebration of the emancipation of slavery, which was in August. This is what it was based on. OK, and this is why on the bank holiday, August, why the carnival in Notting Hill is run. Now it's a ticketed event now. You got to pay to go there but before it was free for everybody where black people wanted to you know stretch the olive leaf out to their white neighbors to say well look we're not here to take away from you we're here to live we've been asked to come here by your government i'm sorry that your government never told you yeah that we're going to live in your communities or they didn't prepare you for what was going to take place you know with our children coming over here and we're here to stay because the government never told white people this they didn't tell them that um black people were going to live here 
became nationalized and they were going to stay here and their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren are going to become part of the British fabric. They didn't tell their people this, unfortunately, like they're not telling their people this about immigration now. Asylum seekers and refugees, they're here to stay. They're here to stay. So you can see that they're repeating the errors of the past. Educate the national people of the country on the truth. Why are you helping these people to come over here? You know you want their cheap labor, you know? And you know you're gonna give them the worst housing. You're gonna give them the poor paying jobs, the poor paying roles, et cetera. But you need their labor because many of the, your own nationals do not want to do those jobs. They see it beneath them. So this is what the Notting Hill Carnival camp. So on the right hand side, you can see the Notting Hill Carnival. On, on, on the left hand side, obviously, the Notting Hill Carnival. On the right hand side, there's a protest, you know, hands off black people. It's talking about the police. Because what the police was doing, because there was a, a, a grouping of black people in, the, in this particular area, etc., it was easy pickings. There was always someone being arrested. And I think it was 75 or 76. They ended up stopping Notting Hill Carnival because of the so-called uh, uh, riots or violence which was taking place, which, is in, which, which was instigated by the police themselves. That's who instigated it. But eventually they ended up um, realigning that as being part of the social fabric of the bank holiday of August. So this is what this is about. Now we're going to be coming to the end now. So we're going to be looking at East Enders first all black cast in 2009. OK, there was a lot of controversy about this in East Enders. OK, the BBC confirmed it received almost 250 complaints over the first episode of East Enders to feature an all black cast in its 24 year history. East Enders is probably about 35 years old now. This is in 2009. A BBC spokesman said that 239 complaints had been received from viewers, with 57 received before it was even aired or broadcasted. So this is amazing. This is the Britain we live in today. This is the 21st century. Talking about Britain being tolerant and all these other type of things. This is, you know, this is the BBC having these complaints. The BBC has not necessarily been um, friends of the West Indian or the black community in its reporting over the years. We need to be honest, they haven't. However, the BBC this time tried to do something. And there was complaints mainly from the white community that this is a travesty, which meant that the black experience is seen to be a peripheral thing, has nothing to do with European, British or white society. So this is what the complaints were really truly about. It is understood that most of the complaints were from people who felt it was inappropriate. It was inappropriate for the BBC to have shown an episode featuring an all black cast. So in Britain, in this multicultural Britain that we live in today, OK, and where people came over to build, many of them lost their lives as moving over here, etc. Many of their children were left behind in the Caribbean, never to come over here. They think it's inappropriate for their story to be seen, which is part of the British social fabric. Then it goes on to say some of the complaints felt it was unnecessary to raise the issue of the Notting Hill riots. This is part of British history, the Notting Hill riots. They should, it shouldn't be mentioned. And this is what this episode was. And it was in honor of the death of Stephen Lawrence and the Macpherson report. This is what this whole thing was about. It, it, it was in celebration of this. And this is what the BBC tried to do, okay? Obviously, it, it wasn't well received by most of the people in the white community, etc., because they still want to keep Britain white and black people not part of the social fabric of British society. It is unusual for East Enders to devote a whole episode, uh, whole episode to a single storyline or set of characters. And this episode was one of these occasions. This was an opportunity to explore in some depth the background and experience of Patrick Truman. That's obviously the uh, the black person who was on the table. One of East Enders' longest standing and most popular characters. OK, the corporation, the corporation said in a statement. So that's all they tried to do. They, they've always had predominantly white storylines, majority more white storylines. Yeah, but to have just like just a black storyline within East within the East End, as if the East End is white today, you know? Come on, people are not living in the 21st century, unfortunately, okay? However, let's have a look at...
what the characters were dealing with. There's four things which they really emphasize, unfortunately. So even though the scene looked good, there was negativity in the scripts which were given to the people, especially when the person Truman, Patrick Truman was speaking. On this particular scene here, he talked about rum, which is a legal drug. He talked about the consumption of ganja at the time, okay, which is an illegal drug. The chasing of women, talking about being promiscuous and looking at steel band songs and dance. That is what it's focused on, okay? Even though it's supposed to focus on the Notting Hill riots. But this was what was missing on what should have been mentioned in the dialogue. They should have talked about the labor market, okay? The amount of taxes that they paid and the work which they did. Some of them, like I said, had two and three jobs, okay? The Jew working household, all black women worked in the labor market. They did not receive welfare. And this is something which they should have emphasized because even to today, people who work within the welfare system don't even know this, that they were discriminated, the welfare state discriminated against them having anything from the state. They can pay taxes, but they couldn't receive taxes if they fell on hard times, okay? They never talked about the state of social housing or the race relation act, which was passed where black people couldn't live in social housing at all. It didn't talk about the economic exploitation, how their wages was less than their white male counterparts, even though they're doing all the time, et cetera. This is what was missing. They didn't talk about the political oppression, where the government didn't intervene in many of the cases, which they should have emphasized. OK, welfare recipients. OK, which they wasn't. That should have been emphasized as well, looking at the welfare state. And this was the second scene. OK, um, what I'm going to show here is looking at the dialogue. So this is a second scene. So here, the black person on the right, I can't remember who the actor is, um, on, on the left, he's an academic. And obviously you have Chelsea, who is the daughter of Denise, the, the character. OK, so let's have a look at the verbal and nonverbal form of communication, which is in this. And if you know movies and films, you know that the main character or dialogue is a person who sat on the left hand side of the screen. They're usually the dominant character. This is how it works within the film industry. So the male is the academic and the female is the beauty. So the white is the male emphasis in this dialogue. And obviously the yellow is the female. So. He's trying to give her a history lesson in the cafe, a history lesson about the race riot that took place in Notting Hill in 1958. However, all she is concerned about is clubbing, having dinner, him taking out for dinner and having sex with him. OK, cultural dislocation. The cultural dis he actually emphasized she has cultural dislocation because in her part of the dialogue, she's talking about you're talking about the riots, what riots? You're talking about us, who is us, who is we? She is totally not part of the West Indian or the African Caribbean experience, which is quite common with, with, with many people. But this is what her character was based upon, that she had no love or passion for her people at all. OK, and the subject too much for contact. OK, so he was basically put off by the fact is he's trying to teach her about her history and all she's concerned about is having him as a boyfriend or whatever the case may be. So this is what came out. So even though there's a positive and negative aspect in the dialogue, we can actually see what comes out of this particular experience. Now we're going to look at just a couple of things here, looking at domestic violence towards black women on screen. Now, EastEnders have showed two forms of black domestic violence towards women. However, unfortunately, they have focused it on it being coming from white men, okay, from white men. Because there was a belief in during slavery, and even up until today, that black women are violent. And even when in the 1970s and 80s, when a lot of black women were going to white um, refuge centers, et cetera, for help, et cetera, they were usually turned away because there was a belief in British society that if anybody was being abused domestically in a West Indian home, it would have more likely been the male and not the female. And this is why Bauzo started off. The reason why Bauzo started off in the 1980s was because white organizations for domestic violence was not helping black women. 
They didn't believe they were being abused. They thought if anyone was the abuser, it was her towards her man and towards her children. And that belief still exists somewhat even till today. So what I'm trying to show you here that black women do suffer domestic violence at the hands of black men. But EastEnders seem to focus on it coming from white men. OK, I do think this is a bit unfair, you know, but the fact of the matter is, you know, I think they should have made it more dimensional, looking at it in both ways. The bottom one was uh, Carmel. OK, she was a social worker. OK, and her husband was something else. He was jealous of her, of her position. And what this actually shows that black women probably are more successful in their profession than black males, sometimes even more um, than their white male counterparts uh, who are husbands or partners. And a similar thing with the woman at the top, which is Denise, OK? Her husband was domestically abusing her. And this was a horrific scene when he ended up punching her in the mouth and she spat out her tooth. But what I'm trying to show you here is that is only recently, this at the bottom was done in the 1980s. And if my memory serves me right, I'm sure that the Denise one, which is at the top, took place in the 19, late 1990s, early 20th century, with the, looking at domestic violence. So what I have here is that domestic violence has been happening towards black women for centuries, especially on the plantations by slave owners, whipping, beating them, and all kinds of things, okay? Black women were seen as being masculine, who beat up men. And this exists even till today. They talk about the concept of the angry black woman, you know, the tough black woman, the masculine woman, okay? They were known as sexual predators and promiscuous women. And this was actually emphasized in the film 12 Years a Slave, where a white man was raping and beating a black woman. And the wife, knowing what he was doing, was also abusing the black woman herself. Rather than trying to deal with her husband or what have you, she was literally seeing the victim as the perpetrator. And this is, this is history. This is what happened during slavery. So when we're looking at the forms of different types of abuse, et cetera, you know, there's physical, verbal, and sexual abuse. But what I want to emphasize here is that East End has actually tried to deal with domestic abuse towards black women, because that's something which is not really spoken about, really, in discourses or within movies or films. I think in most movies, they, they do talk about the black male towards the black female. But East Enders seem to focus somewhat on the white, maybe because they didn't want to be fall, they didn't want to fall into the trap of stereotyping, whatever the case may be. And yet again, we see East Enders, and this only came out in March at this time. I don't watch East Enders, but this was an article I come across during my research, where a white man again is being violent towards this time a dark-skinned woman who happens to be mixed race this time. So we stand as still carry on this thing that only white men can be violent towards dark skinned women who can actually abuse women. And people actually, and it says here, the BBC, BBC standards, domestic violence scene, leave viewers feeling sick. I actually feel sick. And what I want to emphasize with this particular thing is that he's supposed to have kneeled on her. There was a thing where he's supposed to have kicked her in the stomach as well. OK, and viewers were very horrified by this. But domestic violence is not a pretty thing anyway. But what I want to emphasize here is that EastEnders seem to have a tradition in showing black women being domestically violated, OK, by white men. OK, and that's the end. Thank you very much, and I hope you uh, enjoyed my presentation.